Okay, we are live. Welcome aboard, everybody. This is Gary Wilson, and welcome to tonight's live investor agent training webinar. And welcome aboard also to everybody who's been through uh, any of the other training programs, whether it's flipping for profits, rental problems without the pain, or turning rental problems into real estate profits. That's the property manager course. So welcome aboard. Particularly welcome aboard to all the new folks. Um, a little bit of housekeeping here. You will see that you have a question box. Initially, that's how we uh, we ask questions. So we use the question box to do that, and I answer them every now and then. I, I can I can and will unmute some of you. All right, um, and we'll go live, and it'll be audio as, as well, and everybody can hear it. Um, let's see. We are nearing the end of the year here, and I want to give you an update. Next week, I've got a special guest. His name is Tuan Than. He's from Las Vegas. He's in one of my mastermind groups, and he's a financial planner, and he's pro real estate. Um, and he has a lot of uh, a lot of customers who are Asian, and one of them happens to be a member of the uh, Asian Investors of America. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to that group when I'm in Las Vegas in February. But in any case, uh, Tuan is going to come on next week, and he has a, a program or process he's going to give you, he's going to show you how it works, how to use it, and then give it to you to give to your clients. Um, I mean, you can give it to them all year round, but particularly right now at Christmas time, it's a great thing you can do to offer to send to your clients as a sort of a Christmas gift, if you will, you know, or Hanukkah, whichever the case may be. So you definitely want to be on uh, next week. Uh, Beverly should probably promote that a little bit this next, this coming week uh, to, to get more um, interest. Um, and by the way, he said, uh, Tuan is a very good guy. Um, when I was a kid, my family and my church sponsored Vietnamese refugees. And he was, he escaped from Vietnam. He's got a really interesting story about uh, him and himself and his family and a little bit of heartbreaking, but also uh, some good, some good stuff there. So got to meet his kids and everything. He's a great guy. So in any case, keep an eye out for that. Um, also coming up here, I'm in Alabama this week. Uh, I will be in Atlanta the next two weeks. So if any of you guys are on from Atlanta, um, Lev Mills and I are looking to get a group together while I'm there. Uh, we'll meet at one of the market centers after class, maybe grab a pizza, something like that. So if you're from Atlanta, uh, keep an eye out for that and let us know if you have an interest in it. Just send me a text message or email, okay? Okay, so let's dig into some content here tonight. First thing is I want to go over couple questions we had and I apologize I'm going to repeat myself a little bit here but one of the questions I realized I should have uh, turned on a recording before I answered it and the, the question is where the comment was is um, are some of the investor clubs uh, somewhat um, you know agent averse and the answer is yes some of them are uh, not completely in fact you'll have a, or you'll have a mixture of investors there and other service providers like lenders, like lawyers, like inspectors, different contractors, um, you know, pest control. Everybody, all the vendors are represented at the at the investor clubs. I'm going to use RIA as our standard acronym. RIA stands for Real Estate Investors of America, and the reason is they're the largest uh, in North America. And I spoke. I used to be an active member. I'm going to re renew my. Uh, my membership because I've been speaking for those groups and I'm starting to pick up on that again. So in any case, let's just say RIA represents all investor clubs. Some investor clubs are more aggressive and progressive than others, some less. Um, I've been in some pretty sizable groups where they're like, hey, they, they see us as a valuable member of their team um, when they're doing it correctly. Okay, So there's been a movement in the last decade, uh, really a decade and a half, I guess, um, to, to realize the team concept and the fact that a realtor is, is every bit as valuable, if not more valuable, than some of the other vendors um, in, a, in a group, okay? So a good question, and the fact is, is if you're new to the group, uh, you always want to position yourself uniquely. You don't want to go in there with just a standard real estate business card. Um, you want to go in with information and tools. Bring stuff for that that's, that shows people you're not just talking, you're walking. Um, you, can, you, you don't just tell them what, can, what they can do and what you can do for them. You actually show them and demonstrate them. Bring your computer. Bring in examples. Bring in blank forms and hand them out like candy. Okay? 
um, that's how you're going to differentiate yourself, right? And if you've got some case studies, some other investors you've helped, uh, bring in some printouts of those deals, okay? So a good, good question, Debbie. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, the other question is, or one of the other questions is, um, the potential increase in interest rates. Um, you know, nobody has a crystal ball. <laughs> we, and we have, there's been times in the last four to five years where we were predicting interest rate increases and it just didn't happen. In fact, there have been situations where they've actually decreased the rates even further. So I've just learned to not really ever pro prognosticate. However, um, there is a pretty good sense uh, with what Donald Trump gonna, going to be the president here, it appears, um, and with his uh, uh, pro business attitude that we're going to likely see some interest rate increases because uh, there'll likely be inflation and inflation is a direct result of increased GDP. So just a brief little expl explanation here. GDP has been anemic um, in this last uh, expansion. So in other words, if you look at this past recession that started back in 2007, um, the recovery that started, you know, probably say around uh, 2012, all right, depending on where you are in the country. The recovery phase we've been in, which has now been going on for four to five years, has been the, the least productive of all um, expansions after a recession. Um, and there's a number of reasons. I mean, the, the biggest one is that uh, we just really don't have, we've been, we've, been, we've been printing too much money without the sufficient backing. In other words, we're, we're basically been um, supporting the economy artificially. And, it, and people know that. And the money people know that. Um, and the rest of the world knows it too. So the, that's been kind of an issue. Our credit rating has dropped for the first time in history. So there's a number of factors behind all this. But regardless, it looks like the direction we're taking is, is instead of increasing taxes, there's likely going to be some, some tax cuts. Um, could, could be individual, could be business, could be a combination. I, I don't know. It just I'm telling you that we're going to have some tax cuts. All right. And what that does is that frees up capital to remain in circulation, to remain in, in, um, in production that can be used to generate more commerce, to build infrastructure, to build business, to hire people. So what that means is that increases GDP. So historically, whenever you see one administration uh, lower taxes, you'll see a you'll see a boom. You'll see an increase in business activity, increase in hiring, and that naturally generates inflation. It's just part of the game. It's just it's not that it's a bad thing. It just it just is. Okay, so that's what's going to generate increased interest rates. You you increase interest rates to help counter the effect of inflation. Um, that's what they do. That's one of the tools they use. So what that what does that do to us? Well, for the for the owner occupant business. Um, Historically, it could slow things down, but I will tell you, if you look at the history of interest rates, guys, what we've been seeing the last, you know, four to five years have been the, the lowest interest rates we've seen in 50 years since the 1960s. Um, so as interest rates increased in the 60s, um, it really didn't, didn't hamper um, real estate, people buying and selling homes that much. At least in the beginning, it didn't start to have an effect until the 70s. And definitely in the 80s it did, because in the 80s, in beginning um, the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, we had the 18% interest rates, 20% interest rates, and people had to get real creative with real estate. So the volume of transactions had dropped, but transactions were still occurring because people were getting creative with their financing. All right, so that's very extreme, very dramatic. When I started investing, I was paying 9%. <laughs> we thought that was great, you know. So relatively speaking. Let's say we went up to 4%, 5%, 6%. Historically speaking, that, that's not bad. Now, consumers are the ones who are going to see that as being, holy smokes, I was going to pay 3% in 2016, and now I'm going to pay 6%. That's just horrible. But investors who know the game are going to look at that and say, you know what? 6% is still very favorable relative to historical averages. And not only that, investors do the analysis, the financial analysis on a property, and they look at the cash flow. They look at the cap rate and look at the cash on cash return. So what a long way around, a long way of me uh, uh, answering this, your question, Tasha, is this. You, will, you, you could see a slowdown in the owner-occupant business. I don't think it's going to be that dramatic, if at all. 
if interest rates go up to four percent and five percent because people you know that that's a great deal that's an excellent interest rate all right um, but if it shows up it's going to show up in a residential world in the investor world what investors do is they just look at the look at the property look at the opportunity and structure the deal according to the to the criteria and the terms that are existing in the in the current economy, you know investors always find a way. We don't care if the economy is up, down, left, right. It just doesn't matter. We still chug right along. So if you're if you're focusing on investors, I honestly wouldn't worry about it. Um, that's been my experience, and I've been doing this since the '80s, so I've been through a couple of cycles. Uh, but with the owner occupants, I have seen slowdowns in the past, but generally it was when there were more dramatic. Increases in rates, like going up to eight, nine, and ten percent. You know that's when we saw slowdowns, not at the three, four, and five percent range. Okay. And okay, so I hope that answers your question there. Um, and at the end of the day, I will say this: you just have to wait and see. <laughs> um, and good entrepreneurs always improvise, adapt, and overcome. No matter what, we always find a way. All right. So okay, let's see. I think there was another question there. Uh, let's see. Uh, second item to potentially discuss is IRS 425 or 469 rule, which talks about real estate professionals that might qualify for the passive activity loss if they own rental properties and spend 750 hours as a real estate agent broker. Um, and I think, let's see, is that, is that, Natasha? hey Natasha, um, believe it or not, that's not the first time that's come up, and I'm really not qualified to, um, to provide commentary on that. Other than to say it's come up before and it's never been it's never been passed, um, you know certainly as real estate agents we're considered uh, professionals and we're, we 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 had this what's similar to what we call dealer status. So as we we earn income from commissions, that's earned income, and we have to pay social security tax on that and in, in income tax and some other stuff, right? Um, income from rental properties is considered passive income. Always has. And at least for the moment, still is. You know, if I, I don't, if this is, you know, I won't provide a lot of commentary, Natasha, but I will give you my, my personal opinion. Um, I've been, I'm an investor and a broker, okay? Now, on my, on my rental income, obviously, I don't pay Social Security tax on that, right? I only pay income tax on that. So the big question is, is um, could they, could the government construe, could the IRS construe passive income um, as being, earned income because we are already professional real estate professionals by virtue of the fact that we have a license you know I think I say the answer is no because the the nature of the income is completely different passive income from rentals is not the same as has the same characteristics as income we get from earning commissions two completely different uh, types of activities are involved and obviously we're heavily involved in the world of agency of earning commissions when it comes to rental properties yeah, you might be more involved when you first start out, but by nature, it's still passive income. You know, rental income is still passive income. And as you grow your portfolio, you become less and less involved in the daily activities of, of uh, running those, those properties. You have other people do that for you, so it truly is passive income. So my opinion is, um, I don't think we're going to see it, but as far as a commentary um, or advice, I just can't do that because you, there's, you know, who knows what the heck's going to happen. I just don't think it will. Because that's a big, big industry, and that's a there's a lot of people um, who invest. I mean, it's this, the numbers are staggering, and obviously that includes Donald Trump. So, in any case, I, I know where the question is coming from because uh, it's been it's popped up, and it's certainly a, a, a matter of discussion. It may find its way in, in front of Congress. I just don't think it's going to change. I'd be would be shocked if it did. So, in any case, uh, let me see here if I got to. Um, any other questions here? You're welcome, Debbie. Uh, Herminia. Uh, hi, Herminia. Uh, I just see a black s screen. Um, here, Herminia, there must be something on your end because it, it looks like everybody's able to. I mean, I'm seeing it myself, and everybody seems to be seeing it. Um, you might try a refresh. Uh, I'm not sure when you logged in what happened when you logged in. Um, I wish I could help you there more directly, but I'll tell you what, let's uh, try a refresh, Romina. Um All I have is the intro page. Let's see here. Is that Herminia again? 
that's somebody else. Let me see who K.A. is. Hang on one second, guys. I'm not sure. Well, well regardless, oh, Karen. Hey, Karen Rose. Um, yeah, the screen you should be seeing should say at the top, it should say XII, Roman numeral 12, rent, sell, in parentheses, flip, comma, or lease option. Um, if you have apples, that might be kind of a quandary there, but there is a, there are instructions to follow for people who are Apple users. I know a number of you are Apple users on you. You've already done that months before. Um, but send an email to Beverly. She'll hook you up with Paul. Um, we'll get you the recording. I would listen tonight. You'll get the recording tomorrow, so you get the visual. And more importantly, you can uh, you can get instructions for how to use GoToWebinar on an Apple or a Mac if that's the case. So let me reduce this panel here and go back to the question box. Um, and I apologize, I can't offer any more direct support right now. I'm just I'm not a not a technician. Um, Okay. All right. So let's get started here, guys, on the, the back to the wholesaling so we can wrap this up. Um, I'm going to reduce my screen so I can't see questions here for a moment, and then we will bring the panel back over and look for questions. All right. First things first. So we've gone through two sessions of wholesaling. Um, and at this point, let's say we're, we're working with a client. Um, we've got everything under contract. Uh, the client's done their marketing. And the, no buyer, no buyers coming forward. Nobody's going to buy the contract and then eventually buy the property. So what do we do? Well, there are a couple options. Okay. Let's say let's if you're the wholesaler, perhaps you might be able to uh, pull the magic bunny out of your hat and get this thing on. Get this get this thing closed. Actually, get it to the closing table. Or in the case of your client, maybe they bring in a partner, something like that. Instead of wholesaling it, instead of selling the contract, they actually do buy the property. Okay, and if you think about it, it is a valid opportunity, an option because you wouldn't be wholesaling the property if you didn't yourself think it was a good deal. All right. So, assuming you've done everything correctly, you've got a good deal here. You don't want to see it go away, and then the and then the seller is upset and they're harmed in some way because of this. So let's say there's some way to pull this through and you get the thing where you can purchase it. Two options are you can um, you can um, remodel it and sell it as a flip or you can keep it as a rental. All right, but I want to talk about that a little bit because when you go into a transaction, whether you're actually you're buying it with the intention of going forward with the purchase um, or you're wholesaling it, you need to know what the ultimate game is. Is this going to be a flip property? Or is this going to be a rental property? And you have to understand it at the outset, and it has to be that it has to be the goal. And the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing this so much is, is let's say, okay, you get the property in a contract, and your intention is to, um, you know, remodel the property, and you were going to keep it to rent, all right? But you decide you're going to now flip it. That's actually not as big a deal as you might think, and the reason is is it's easier to go from um, renting, if, if, if buying a property with the intention of renting it, and changing your game plan to decide to flip it. The reason is is you haven't put a lot of money into the property that you wouldn't normally get out of it. Right? In other words, um, you can flip a rental property quite easily. In fact, there's an entire strategy behind it. I don't know if I have time to go into it tonight. Maybe I'll. Maybe I'll do that next week. But people flip rentals just like they flip single family homes. And what you do is you remodel the property using a standard workmanship and materials that are that are in alignment with rental properties. You get the property rented out, so you get it fully occupied, showing an income, and then you sell it for profit. Okay? In other words, it's an excellent strategy. Instead of just flipping single family homes that people are going to live in, um, to purchase and live in owner occupants, you can buy properties with the intention of it being a rental, but you end up flipping it at the end of the day anyways, because you rent it for so much money that the cap rate looks pretty juicy, the cash on cash return looks juicy, the place is remodeled, and you could possibly make make a good uh, turn a good profit on that. Okay, so that's that's the good news. All right. Now on the other hand, let's say you were the intention was to 
flip the property and you decide later on you want to change your strategy and you want to keep it and rent it. The challenge is, is let's say you've been remodeling the property, right? You're going down the road, you're going to flip it, you're remodeling it, you're putting in new carpeting, new cabinetry, um, you know, new windows, new doors, the, the whole nine yards, new roofing, new deck. Um, and then later on you decide you're going to keep it and rent it, all right? Because maybe maybe it didn't maybe it's not selling like you thought it would. The challenge is is when you remodel a property for flipping, you're more than likely going to use more expensive material. Uh, the craftsmanship is going to cost you more money. All right. In other words, the 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 rehab project is going to be more expensive on a flip than it typically is on a rental. All things considered, the same. Let's say you got two properties side by side. One's going to be flipped. One's going to be rented. All right. In other words, one's going to be flipped to an owner-occupant. One's going to be held for, for renting purposes. Um, they both needed the same types of repairs. All right? They were both had the same deferred maintenance. You would spend more money on flipping a property for, for an owner-occupant than you would remodeling a property that's going to be held for rentals because, it's, because the materials will be different. More expensive on the, on the flip for owner-occupants, less expensive on the remodeling for renting. Okay, so what I'm getting out of here is if you go down a pathway of you purchase a property, you're spending money on remodeling, and you decide that at the end of the day you're, you're, you're going to rent it, the rents might not justify the cost basis, cost basis being purchase plus remodeling, if the original intention was to sell it to an owner occupant. Okay, so that's the risk. So in other words, you can, you can switch strategies going from flipping to, to rental more easily than you can f switch strategies going from uh, renting to flipping. So I want to make sure that makes sense here. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit more information here and then I'll pull the panel back over for, uh, for questions. But basically what I'm going over here is in the material, the description of what this looks like and how you, how you react to it. Uh, by the way, if you, if you haven't already, uh, you should get the book uh, Flipping for Profits um, without the risk. Okay, the, the title in here is the old title. You, you'll get the new title, right? Um, so in any case, uh, let's say um, you do that, all right? You're going to, let's say you're going to, you're, you're going to, you got a house, uh, and in this case you were going to rent it, you decided to sell it, all right? If you're not a licensee, you might want to get a licensee to do that. And here's this goes back to Debbie, your question. The reason is, is a licensee generally will be able to attract a larger audience and command a higher price, all right, on average for a property that you're selling through a real estate company. People who do for sale by owner um, often do not fully realize um, the, the, full, the full profit potential on a property because they're just not is qualified. They don't have the same tools we have, all right? So let's say this was the case. Let's say you decided you're going to flip it. You want to approach this um, on the marketing end of things like a consumer would when they're going to go buy their own home. This is you, you're going to decide to flip it. You're going to get it marketed. You want to actually go through the process that a consumer would go through to look at the property, starting out by driving down the street and observing and seeing what well, you see. What does that, you know, does it catch your eye? Does this property catch your eye um, above all of the properties on that street? If it's newly remodeled, you would hope that it would, right? So um, hopefully the impression is good. What does the mailbox look like? What does the sidewalk look like? What does the front door and the storm door look like? Okay, you know, does your, are you filled with anticipation to grab that doorknob to open it up? And you should be, all right? And in fact, if you think about it, this is one of the most critical points of showing a property. When someone grabs that doorknob, that's the first physical contact with the property. It, it's a big deal, and it, there's some kind of psychology behind it, but they just trust me, it's a big deal. Okay, so um, you know you've got to change your strategy here. You're not thinking in terms of rental now. Now you're thinking in terms of flip. Um, and to go back to my discussion earlier about the cost of remodeling and the materials and the workmanship, here's how it really plays out. All right. Let's say you decide you're gonna you're gonna cut some corners and save a buck. Here's what happens. Let's say you do a quick ten dollar fix. Most consumers have a powerful enough uh, their op powers of observation are good enough that they can tell that you took a shortcut. And what's going to happen is psychologically their mind's going to be going down a, a spiral 
a negative spiral of wondering, well, if you could, if you took a shortcut here on this small thing, you use a ten dollar doorknob versus a, a twenty five dollar doorknob. What else did you take? Did you cut corners on? What else could be wrong with the property? And that's their mindset. They're going to be looking for other things to be wrong with the property. And if that negative state of mind is hard to overcome, you're going to get lower offers. It's just you know, for those of you who've been around the business for a while, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but it it happens. It's a psychological phenomenon that you. It's very difficult to overcome. Now, on the other hand, let's say you you took the extra step. So you were going to spend twenty-five dollars on a doorknob, and you decided to spend thirty-five dollars on a doorknob. That extra ten dollars could actually have the a positive effect on a potential buyer. In other words, they look at that and they're thinking, "Geez, you went the extra mile on something small like that. What else should you go the extra mile on?" And they start looking for things and basically validating their impression that you really dressed this place out to the nines. You did an excellent job remodeling. Uh, there's probably nothing wrong with the place because you took care of the little details, all right? So in other words, it's that spiral but in a positive upward motion, all right? Uh, it's an interesting psychological phenomenon. If you've ever experienced, you know what I'm talking about. But what I'm getting out of here is if you're going to take this property on, you got to think of the consumer. And you really got to, it just goes back to the beginning of the class tonight, the, the webinar tonight. You got to really be certain of your strategy and stick to it as best you can. If you have to switch strategies, just be a bear in mind. Um, it's easier to go from flipping for owner occupants to remodeling for rental than it is to go from remodeling for rental to uh, flipping for owner occupants, okay? Um, so two, two different strategies. You can go back and forth. I shouldn't try to persuade you one way or the other. Um, just bear in mind, if you go from flipping where you're spending more money to a rental strategy, the rents might not uh, be enough to, the other words, the ends might not justify the means. Okay. Now, let me pause for questions here because I'm going to go into lease options, which is a hybrid approach, and it's the final approach that we'll go over. Um, but I want to make sure everybody's, oops, hang on one second. Let me get my arrow pointed correctly here. Okay. It looks like we're okay on questions. Um, yeah. I think we're okay on questions. All right. So lease options. I'm going to reduce my panel, guys, so you're not going to be able to – I'm not going to be able to see your questions for a moment. All right. So let me get this queued up correctly here. Oops. Lost my uh, – there it is. Whoops. Now I'm all over the place. Okay, hang on one second. We'll get there. Okay, lease options. Well, I'm getting this queued up. What a lease option is, it's really a hybrid approach, okay? Some of you may know what it is, but there, it's very applicable to our circumstances here, all right? So what this is is, let's say... Uh, you have a property, the contract, the, the, the wholesaling part of the game didn't work out. You or your client were not able to sell the, whole, sell the contract. You couldn't assign it and make a wholesale fee. You decide to uh, purchase it, you or your client, or somehow or other you get it purchased, you remodel it for the intention of flipping it. Now, what happens is all of a sudden something changes in the economy. You know, interest rates bump up a little bit, like we were discussing earlier. Uh, or it just you head into the winter months and the business slows down and all of a sudden you've got this nice newly remodeled property there that's not moving it's not selling um, you know that you can rent it but maybe the rents don't justify the overall the, the cost basis of the property which is what we just discussed earlier and that's why now if you're wondering why I was discussing all that here's why I'm leading you down to this point right here this is a good option um, if all else fails, all right, or it's another another approach you can take to keep the train on the tracks. So what happens is you do actually rent the property out, but you're not doing a rent to own, and you're not just doing a straight lease. You're going to have two parts of this: the lease and an option to purchase. Okay, so prospective consumer will lease the property on a on a maybe a, a one year basis, a one year term, with the intention of purchasing the property and what you do to to make that uh, um, 
more official and to make it uh, uh, basically hold their feet to the fire is you have them purchase what's called an option agreement. Okay, this option agreement gives them the option to purchase the property at a future date. All right, so you have a lease. That's part one. So there's two parts to this. The lease is part one. It's a standard lease. They're going to rent it for a year. Okay. Um, by the way, one benefit of this approach is you generally can command a higher rent when you do lease options. So right out of the gate, you're appeasing your your investor, your client, to say, look, I, you know, I know we're talking about leasing it here, but I'm telling you, here's how you can get more rent, and here's how you do it: lease options. So lease for more money initially, all right, and then you ha also have the, pers the person leasing the property, the renter, execute what's called an option agreement. In other words, they indicate that they want to buy the property, um, but maybe they don't have the money for a down payment now, maybe their credit is not as good as it needs to be. So the option agreement is not a sales agreement. The option agreement is simply just as it's stated. It gives the, the purchaser the right to purchase the property, the property they're now renting, at a future date at a predetermined price. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. Why would people do this? Well, let's talk about the owner. The owner of the property, you know, might not want to be stuck with this property, and maybe they don't want to just do a standard lease. You know, they if they choose a lease option, they can lease the property to someone who has is more highly motivated to eventually purchase the property. They also will be more highly motivated to pay all their rent on time, okay? Because this owner is going to be that renter's best creditor for a year. That tenant typically is not going to have a bigger monthly bill than rent. So you document for a year that this tenant has paid rent every month faithfully on time in full, okay? Um, now back to the owner. So they get a property rented to a person who's going to treat it like as if it was their own property. In other words, they, they know they're going to purchase it. They're going to start living in there and treating it and acting as if they actually own it, all right? Because they do think they're going to own it eventually, and they may they may in fact own it eventually. Some other good benefits to the owner. You typically have the, the tenant pay all utilities, all bills, all everything, including even the insurance bill. Okay, now what you do is you pay the insurance bill and you have the tenant reimburse it. If you really want to get um, advanced, you can do this in certain places like up in New York, uh, Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, um, where there uh, you know things. It's more aggressive up there. It's more expensive. You can do what's called a triple net lease, and a tenant would even pay for the property taxes. All right, um, I wouldn't go that far, but I know people that do that. So. In any case, um, so back to the owner. The, the other benefit, obviously, is this. That per, the, the tenant has the intention to purchase the property at the end of the lease term. So at the end of the year, the, guy, the owner is eventually going to get the property sold, no doubt about it. All right? But here's something else. The, the option fee is non-refundable. Okay? The option fee is not a down payment. It does not go towards the purchase of the property. What it is is it's a, it, they're purchasing the right to have first right of refusal on that property. In other words, the owner, the downside of the owner is, is they can't entertain any other purchaser throughout that year. They have to hold the property off the market for that tenant to get their ducks in a row so that that tenant has a, has a first option to purchase the property. But let's say that that tenant ends up not purchasing the property. The owner gets to keep the option fee because all it was was a fee, a purchase price of the option document. That's all it was. Another important point here is this. If you notice, we're doing a lease option. We're not doing a rent to own. Rent to own is a is a is uh, not a good deal, guys. And the reason is, is typically you're applying some portion of their down. They're going to give you a larger down payment, not an option fee, but an actual deposit. Most owners of a rent to own are intending to take a portion of that initial down payment or deposit to apply towards the purchase of the property. And furthermore, they're applying a, per a portion of the monthly rent to the purchase price too. So here's the downside of that. Yeah, you might be doing the tenant a favor by allowing, allowing them to accumulate a certain amount of money in the form of a deposit that can be used as a down payment when they do get financing. Okay, that sounds good. And that's good for the tenant. But let's say the tenant ends up not purchasing the property. In fact, they default 
and they default on the lease too. They stop paying rent because they realize, hey, I can't pay this thing. I'm going to stop paying rent and just eventually move. Well, let's say that happens and, and you or your owner have to go to court and you're thinking you're going to go to uh, file a landlord or tenant complaint and they start the eviction process. But what happens is as soon as it goes to court in front of the judge, the judge is going to raise his hand and say, wait a second, this is a, this is a rent to own. I can't hear this case because as long as even just one dollar has been applied towards the purchase price of the property, that tenant now has what's called um, one of the equity, one of the rights of ownership, which is equity. They have a degree of equity in the property. They own one dollar of that property, and in this case, obviously, it's going to be probably more like a few hundred or, four, or a few thousand. But it doesn't matter. All it has to be is, is uh, one dollar. So if you applied one dollar of rent towards the purchase price, and that tenant defaults on the lease, um, you can't just evict them. You have to what do what's called foreclose on them. Now, some really bad news here is this: an eviction generally you can do in about thirty to forty-five days. It's it's longer in some areas like New York, New Jersey, shorter in other areas like Florida. Okay. Um, the big problem is this: the judge is going to say you got to go to the court of common pleas because this is now a foreclosure because that tenant is not just a tenant, that tenant actually owns a, has an equitable interest in the property. Foreclosures currently right now are taking about 13 months minimum. That's minimum guys. The average is a lot longer than that. And I, can, I keep picking on New York. It's only because I just spent a few months up there um, and I have family up there too. I know our foreclosures in New York that have taken four even six years for a foreclosure to finally go through. Um, now let's face it, would you rather have a 30-day eviction or a four-year foreclosure? Let's just say it's 13 months. Let's just compare one-month eviction to a 13-month foreclosure. Where clearly the one-month eviction is much more palatable, much less expensive, um, and much less damaging. So, so if I didn't talk you out of rent-to-owns before, I probably just did it now. Just remember, rent to owns has some very serious inherent uh, negative aspects to them, okay, versus a lease option. Lease option, not one dime of rent goes towards the purchase, not one dime of the option fee goes towards the purchase either. So that, that tenant has no equitable interest in the property. So if a lease option tenant defaults on the lease, you just simply evict them. That's all it is. And you keep the, you keep the uh, option fee. So it's a wonderful, wonderful way um, to sell a house. Both parties have some, some pros. Both parties have some cons. Um, again, the owner is going to have to take the property off the market. They can't uh, uh, entertain any other purchase or any other purchase, any other person, excuse me, while, it's, uh, while the option period is open. Okay? As soon as the option period closes, that owner can do one of two things. They can extend the option period and charge a fee for that. They can offer a brand new option to the same person and charge a brand new fee for that. Or they can say, I'm sorry, this isn't working out. You'll have to leave by the end of the month. And that owner now has the uh, it's three more choices. They can again try to sell the house. They can just simply rent it out. Or they can try another lease option. And the reason I mention that is, and some of you are probably wondering, well, Gary, why would they do that again if it didn't work the first time? Well, it depends on how you look at it. They, remember, they got an option fee. Maybe it was five thousand dollars that they got to keep, and they, in the meantime, had rented the house for typically higher than market rents to a family who was treating it like it was their own home because they thought they were going to purchase it to live there. So you get your property back generally in better condition. You get the option fee, and you had higher rents the whole time. So why wouldn't you do it again? I've had I have had houses, guys. <coughs> why well, leased option as many as three times before I eventually did actually sell. Never had a problem and actually did that. I actually had uh, option um, option E's pay me two or more option fees because they were spent determined to buy that house. Okay, <clears throat> So there are some obvious benefits and a few, a few cons you need to think of. In any case, I wanted to give you that strategy <clears throat> to consider. I want, want to bring my panel back over. And look for some questions here. So let me give you a second to type in your questions if you have any. <clears throat> I 
Okay, let's see what we got here. Hang on one second. Um, this should generate some interest because a lot of people are not real clear on uh, how um, lease options actually work. So, in any case, um, let me look and see. Okay, here we go. This is from. I mean, what would the range of the option fee be? Good question. On a percentage basis, we generally recommend 5%. Now, the challenge is if you're in an area where the average home price is $500,000, you're now talking about $25,000 for an option fee. Um, that certainly can be can be done. It's just going to be you know, more difficult. <laughs> Because uh, I don't care where you are, $25,000 is a whole lot more than, say, $5,000 in an area where the average home price is only $100,000. Um, however, I would always start at 5%. I would always start there first. And you can always negotiate yourself your way down if you want to. Um, but let's face it. Let's, let's say you're in an area where the average home price is $500,000, all right? Um, and the person is the, the – the, Based on their current circumstances, the lenders are telling them they need to have 20% down. Well, that would mean they would have to have $100,000 in a case of a $500,000 property. Okay, so in that regard, $25,000 doesn't sound nearly as bad as $100,000. And maybe the person has $25,000. Maybe they got $50,000. Maybe they're halfway there. Okay, what, you're, what you can do is still lease the, the property to them. They pay your rent, typically higher rents. Okay, uh, they, they purchase the option agreement, they person purchase the right or the option to purchase the property at a later date. Okay, so they're getting some benefit there. And maybe they got something coming in in the next year, maybe they're getting a court settlement. Okay, um, or any, it could be anything, workman's comp, divorce, uh, an, an estate that was settled. You'd be amazed at how many people have these events going on in their lives. And it's just a matter of time before they get the settlement. But they're, they're big, in the case of a divorce, you know, they might think it's going to be a month, but it ends up being a year. So what you do is you offer them the property. They're glad to do it because maybe it's the house they want. It's the one they definitely want. They don't want to look any further. They just need to tie it up temporarily until they can get their settlement, and then they complete the purchase of the property. So don't ever underestimate or second guess or wonder what somebody else might be thinking Put it out there because you don't know who's going to kind of take advantage of this opportunity, and it happens an awful lot, guys. So, in any case, so one of the that's, that's a good question, by the way. Um, I would say, in a descending economy, you might want to bend a little bit um, and go a little bit lower on your option fees, the actual dollar amount. Um, in a climbing economy where people are still digging out, you could be a little bit more aggressive. Okay, so. In any case, um, that's it for that part of the discussion. Let me go back here and see if there's anything else. Um, we talked about, oops, that was that moved way too fast here. Hang on a second. Let me just make sure I covered everything the way I wanted it to. All right. Let's see. Okay, we talked about that. We talked about don't do a rent to own. Okay. Um, remember, there's multiple rights to ownership. Um, there's there's, uh, there's like something called contractual equity. Uh, of course, there's actual monetary equity, all right. And that's where we talked about rent uh, rent to own not being a good option because it gives somebody um, actual equity in a property. Okay, one of the one of those multiple ownership rights. Um, we talked about the mechanics of how that works. In your option period, by the way, I'm oh, sorry, that was another question I didn't get back to. The option period is typically a year. Now, theoretically, you want to make your option period as short as possible, you know, six months, three months, what have you. However, I've seen options that go out as long as three years. You know, if you look back at the last recession, you know, by the time 2008 hit, it was pretty obvious we were in for a big, big hit. And I saw option periods going out three years. That made sense in that economy. So you have to think in terms of where we are right now. Um, we got people feeling really good about things, and we got people thinking we're headed for the, for the mother of all recessions, even a depression. Um, I don't know. All I know is, is I'm, I like being on a cash basis. 
because uh, you can't go wrong being on a cash basis. Um, I don't like that. I never have liked that. I know it sounds crazy because I used to have a lot of debt, um, but I paid it all off. And life's, life's a lot more pleasant now, so I don't really care so much what the economy does. Um, I just keep chugging right along, you know. So in any case, uh, back to this. Your, the term, the option term, is a critical thing. Right now, one year is about what I would recommend. Um, if, we're, if the economy really takes off, I would say shorten it to six months. If the economy heads for a recession, uh, and I'll just tell you, I, I think that's where we're going, um, you might stretch those terms out. So in any case, let's go back to this. Um, Risk is the big thing with lease options because you typically have less risk of property damage because you're generally running to people who do intend to buy the property. They want to obviously, you know, keep it up. So, uh, by the way, another thing to think about, let's say they don't, let's say your optionee does not exercise the option but they want to stay in the house. You can offer them a new option again. Um, you can you can at that point raise the price of the property that they're that they're going to be locked into. So let's say you had a let's say you're in a lease option on a two hundred thousand dollar property, and the first option said that in a year they can purchase the property for two hundred thousand dollars. Let's say the the option period expires, the year expires, they can't purchase it, but they still want to purchase it. They just need another year. You can. You can not only raise the price of the property, you can raise the option amount, you can even raise the lease amount, you can raise the rent. So you see what I'm saying here, just because a property doesn't sell through a lease option, you still have multiple opportunities to profit in the case in the case when it doesn't actually sell at the end of the lease period. Okay. So just a few things to think about there. Um, let's see here, what else should I, is there anything else I want to go over in this? Um, I think that was pretty much it. It's really just words of wisdom here. I would tell you to be creative, guys. Think outside the box. Um, always remember, wherever there's a lemon, there's a potential glass of lemonade. All right. Um, you know, God doesn't want us to just survive; He wants us to thrive. So you've got to, you've got to really have faith and take action. Um, you know, just remember, millions of people are gone before you. Uh, you know, we start talking more about wholesaling because when people see what's happening in the economy and they hear what they think is going to happen in the economy. Wholesaling is a good thing. It's just one more option for you to, to, to uh, turn a profit for you and your clients. You can wholesale yourself. You can help your clients wholesale. If you're a licensee, wholesaling, just remember there's, there's uh, certain rules you have to follow. Um, any case, uh, that's pretty much it, guys. Let me bring my panel back over one more time. If there's no questions, we will wrap this up for the night, and we will look forward to next week with uh, Tuan. And that is going to be, what night is that? That's going to be next Wednesday, the 14th. So, okay, guys, I appreciate you participating. We had a good turnout tonight. Um, if you, this is the first webinar you've been on, or you've been on for a while but you missed the last two, I highly recommend you get the last two webinars so you have a much clearer and thorough picture of wholesaling. Okay? Um, and also send me emails about what other subjects you want to talk about. After the holidays, we're going to start all over again with all the marketing. We'll start back at the beginning of the program and work our way through. It'll take about six months. Okay? So, in any case, you guys take care of yourselves. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. And I hope you're enjoying the Christmas season, Hanukkah, if you celebrate Hanukkah, if you celebrate Kwanzaa. Um, please uh, uh, send me cards electronically if you want. I like to get them all. Um, I honor whatever whatever practice you participate in. Um, I, I, <laughs> I benefited from all of them, especially at Christmas time, but also when I was growing up. Um, I love getting cards from, from different people. Different, uh, spiritual practices. So uh, mine just happens to be Christmas and so I wish you all a happy holiday season and a Merry Christmas if that's the case. Um, happy Kwanzaa, uh, Happy Hanukkah. If you celebrate none of those, I just hope you enjoy the season with your family. Okay. So God bless you all and we will see you next week. Okay. Bye-bye.